I'm Michael Klein, Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity at the U.S. Department of Education, and it's wonderful to be with you all today. As you all know, the speed, scope, and impact of cyber threats to schools continues to increase. We're seeing this on a number of different fronts. We see five cyber incidents per week impacting our schools across the country. Even just this month in September, we've had a school district that had to close for multiple days at the beginning of the school year because of a ransomware attack. As you know, ransomware is a huge challenge. It's essentially extortion, right? So it's causing school districts to lose access to their systems. They're being asked to pay a ransom in order to get them back. Oftentimes, data is also being taken from those systems and either leaked online or being threatened to have that leaked. And even sometimes, they're reaching out to students and families as a way to pressure school districts as well. This is a really big challenge. And so some school districts have even felt compelled to pay the ransom because they either don't have backups ready or they're concerned that people will find out about it and it'll be a bigger challenge for them and they can't get back up and running. We've also had incidents where business email compromise, which sounds really complicated, but it's actually just usually a phishing email that goes to someone asking them to send money to a different person. Right? And so this is creating a, a fraud situation. We've had school districts lose millions and millions of dollars. We've even recently seen an IT director fired over an incident like this. And so these cyber attacks through ransomware, business email compromise are making a huge impact on our school districts. Some research has shown that $53 billion worth of downtime in the last five years has been impacting schools across the world. And probably one of our biggest challenges is that it's not just individual school districts. This summer, one of our largest providers of student information systems in the country had an outage for a full day. And that system services about a third of the school districts in the country. Had that been during the school year, there's the possibility that that could have taken down a third of the school districts, about 4,000 districts, for an entire day. And they wouldn't have been able to run school buses or other things that schools need to function. So at the Department of Education and across the federal government, we're really focused on how do we support school districts and state education agencies? Because what they're being asked to do is unfair. Um, we need to lift and shift that burden of cyber risk. And so our national cybersecurity strategy, which came out in 2023, identified that school districts are asked to go toe to toe with transnational criminal organizations largely by themselves. And it's not just unfair, it's ineffective. And so at the federal level, we've been really trying to understand where can we step in to support, where can we help states do more where possible, and where can we work with the private sector to ensure that a small school district with one person doing IT, who's also the bus driver and the superintendent, isn't the one being asked to do major cybersecurity stuff. And so here's what we've been doing in the last year. We've really been trying to elevate the importance of K-12 cybersecurity. Probably the most important event that we've had was our Back to School Safely event last August at the White House, it was hosted by First Lady Dr. Jill Biden. We had U.S. Education Secretary Cardona, DHS Secretary Mayorkas, as well as many other federal partners from CISA Director Jen Easterly, Deputy Director of the FBI, as well as our Deputy Secretary of Education state education agency leaders, superintendents, and others to really identify cybersecurity as important, not just as an IT issue, but as an issue that impacts everyone and that we need the support of school boards and superintendents to deeply address. We've also been working across the White House with the National Security Council, Office of the National Cyber Director, as well as bringing this to the press and helping people understand across the country that this is an issue that impacts everyone and we all have a role to play. We've also been releasing actionable guidance for school districts to be able to improve their cybersecurity. And we've been doing that jointly with CISA. And instead of releasing something that was multiple hundreds of pages that becomes a doorstop, we decided to make it 20 to 25 pages with specific actions that districts can take to make themselves more secure, understanding the resource constraints that they already face. And here we're talking about a few really specific things, right? And I think for school safety officials like yourselves and school leaders and district leaders, it's important to talk about this at the top level, right? So we're talking about risk management. Cybersecurity is not something that you just purchase and then you're done. It's a risk management process. And so we have to figure out what are the biggest risks that we have and how do we mitigate those? 
We also need to use analogies to help people understand what we're actually talking about. School districts are very used to fire drills and school safety in that context. And so how do we think about doing cyber safety drills and thinking about the ways in which everyone in a school district has a role to play, everybody in a school has a role to play, and understanding what those roles are and exactly what they need to do at the moment of an incident can be incredibly helpful for mitigating those challenges. We also know that there are a few things that you can do that will dramatically increase your likelihood of preventing or stopping the worst things from happening during a cyber attack. We're gonna talk more about those things, like using multi-factor authentication. And although that sounds really complicated, it's actually not. So we'll talk through that a little bit more. And it's about preparing for when, not if. This is happening, as we said, five incidents a week, all across the country. So we really need an understanding at the executive level, not just the IT level, of what are we gonna do if we can't access the most important systems in our school district and we actually have to close school? Do we have a plan for that? And finally, really emphasizing that vendors have a role to play and that it's not just something that should fall on IT directors, but the vendors who supply the most important systems in our school districts are the folks who can really help us design things securely from the beginning and improve those things along the way. Beyond our guidance to school districts and state education agencies, we're also bringing together the most important stakeholders to help solve this problem. So just this last March, we created the Government Coordinating Council. And while it sounds technical, this is an organization that we can bring together on a regular basis to both understand the challenges faced by all the different stakeholders around K-12 cybersecurity, and also to share the things that we're working on from a federal government perspective to get feedback from the most important stakeholders we have. And we really made this inclusive and as broad as possible. So we have the member organizations for every major stakeholder group, from state education agencies to our superintendents of the largest districts and the smallest districts in the country, folks from school boards, because we know they play a really important governance role, as well as state ed tech directors, IT directors, principals, as well as our special education staff. And we wanna really bring those folks together with all levels of government, including our regional education agencies, to make sure we understand all of the challenges people are facing and address those head on. We're also leveraging public-private partnerships as a way to help drive change with our most important education technology vendors. One of the ways we're doing that is with our partners at CISA, where we were able to create the Secure by Design pledge that helped EdTech vendors know exactly what they can do to create secure products from the beginning and make sure that they're providing them to our school districts in ways that mitigate risks before they even have to touch and work on them. We're also taking this a step further by launching the Partnership for Advancing Cybersecurity in Education. This new partnership is a way for the department to really focus on our sector-specific critical infrastructure and understand the ways in which the systems that help drive our school districts that everyone in the country is using are being built secure and are being addressed in ways that help to mitigate the risks to our school districts. The kinds of infrastructure we're talking about are things like student information systems, which are the heart and soul of every school district, understanding who students are, what classes they're supposed to be, and who you can release those students to. We also think about bus routing and transportation systems. If you can't get students safely to school, then we can't run school. We think about food service and lunch systems that make sure that all students get fed when they get to school, which is a really important function that schools play beyond just educating our students. We think about our IEP and special education systems that ensure that all students have access to the education that they need to learn, and also that that incredibly sensitive information is kept private. We have school security and building access management that ensures that no one who gets into a school shouldn't be there as well as ERP and finance solutions that make sure that teachers get paid. And finally, other technical systems like single sign-on, multi-factor, and other things that I won't get into right now because they get a little bit more technical, but they're really important to the functioning of a school district. If any one of those systems goes down, it makes it really likely that a school district might have to close and maybe have to be closed for multiple days. We're also working really closely with federal partners. We're working with the White House to help protect K-12 schools through a number of different initiatives. We're also working with private sector partners through providing things like protective DNS services, which is a way to stop students from going to malicious sites um, and really stop one element of ransomware before it gets started. 
And really importantly for you all, the FCC has a new cybersecurity pilot program that just launched, and the window will be open until November 1st to apply for these new cyber grants. And this is a way for school districts to purchase cybersecurity software and other things that they might not have money to do so um, through programs like E-Rate and other funding streams. And this is an opportunity to really lean into some of those most important practices like multi-factor authentication as a way of securing those systems. We also have amazing partnerships with CISA. I've talked about a few of them before, but I think one of the most exciting ones is the pre-ransomware notification initiative. This is a way to let victims of cyber incidents know before their systems get locked by ransomware that they have a problem. And so this is a, a new initiative that's about two years old now, and it helps organizations stop those attacks before damage occurs. In 2023, CISA made 117 notifications to K-12 school districts. That's about one every three days to help them prevent or mitigate a ransomware attack. This year, by July, they had already made over 117 notifications to K-12 school districts, and the number continues to grow. So one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you have a really powerful relationship with your local CISA field rep. Um, you also have local FBI agents in your area, and those are the folks who hopefully you have the opportunity to meet and get to know. We can provide you resources to get in touch with them because those are the really the frontline people who you're gonna be working with when an incident occurs. And you don't wanna be exchanging cards with them at the moment of that incident. You wanna know them already and have those relationships built ahead of time. And there's a lot more we need to do to protect our 100,000 schools, 14,000 districts, 650 regional education service agencies, and our 50 states. And so there are a lot of other things that we're continuing to work on, but the things I would recommend to you that are the most high impact steps are working on multi-factor authentication. The reason why we keep coming back to this is that there are three ways that almost every incident starts. You either have compromised usernames and passwords or a phishing attack that allows someone to get the username and password and take over an account. By implementing multi-factor authentication, you're preventing a bad actor from using credentials they find online, usernames and passwords, or requiring them to get a second step before they can gain access to those accounts. So that's probably the most important investment that you can make. And when I talk about multi-factor authentication, I don't want you to think that I'm asking you to have every student all the way down to kindergarten have multi-factor on their accounts. The people I'm really talking about are those who have access to the most important systems and have admin access. So we're thinking about people here like your IT staff, your principals, your superintendent, district staff, as well as potentially um, secretaries and other folks who do data entry for those really important systems. If we can get multi-factor authentication, which can be as simple as an app on your phone um, or a little token that you plug into your computer, that will make those systems way more resilient to these kinds of attacks. The other thing is to sign up for free services like CISA's Cyber Hygiene Service, which allows you to know when you have things that are touching the internet from your system that have vulnerabilities that people are already using to gain access to systems. And this is something that you can sign up for at the address that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And it'll allow you to do the things like update the software that's most important to keep you safe. If you do those few things, you're gonna have a really huge impact on the threats that you face. And then also helping your staff understand and recognize phishing at the levels that they can understand it. However, we don't expect a student in kindergarten to know how to spot phishing and stop a ransomware attack that takes down a school district. By having multi-factor authentication on those most important accounts and then patching those vulnerabilities from the outside, you'll address the biggest risks that we face here. Just wanna bring home the point one more time. You should really get to know your local CISA or FBI point of contact. You'll see ways to access information about who those people are on your screen to make sure that you have the ability to get in touch with them before an incident and not after an incident happens. The most important thing that you can do at a district leadership meeting is help everybody know that cybersecurity is a district priority that everybody needs to work on. And the best way to do that is to do a tabletop exercise. This sounds complicated, but it could be as simple as saying, 
we know that in many school districts, they've lost access to an important system like their student information system, or internet throughout their school district, or bus routing systems. Assuming that an incident is going to occur is the easiest way to actually do one of these tabletop exercises. And so you can start with the assumption that you no longer have access to the important systems you need to make the school district run. And so if you have to close school for the day, what are the steps you need to take to both communicate that internally to your staff and externally to families and other stakeholders to ensure that everyone stays safe? And then also to understand what are the steps from getting to where you are now to fully recovering. And just walking through those at a high level, not in a technical way, but in a way that understands the risk and in a way that understands how to message those risks is going to be incredibly powerful for everyone across your school community if and when this event does happen. So I really appreciate you all taking the time with me today, and I can't wait to hear what some of our members from the GCC have to say on our next panel.